You're listening to audio from New King Church. If you'd like to get our weekly sermons, hit subscribe. If you'd like to check out more resources or donate to this ministry, please visit newkingchurch.com. All right. So today we're going to be reading from Psalm uh, 22. So if you have a Bible, just uh, follow along with me. And we're just standing in reverence to God. And at the end, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord. And you can say, thanks be to God. So I'm going to start. <clears throat> my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, uh, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. And in, in you, they trusted and were, put, and were not put to shame. But I am a worn I am a worm <laughs> and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raven and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breath. My strength is dried up like a pot, a, a pot shirt, <laughs> and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They starve, they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers, in the midst of the con congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All of you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All of you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or adorned the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth, eat and worship before him and bow all those who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Pr posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to, to a people yet unborn that he has done it. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, I just thank you for this time that we have here in prayer, in worship, in the reading of your word. Um, and as Aaron prays today, I'd just like you to impart him with, with wisdom. that he might, he might speak and we might hear you, Lord, and it might, it might 
uplift us and cause us to read the word daily and just continue to go about our lives with, with great joy in your name, Lord. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, Jamal, for that delivery of the <laughs> scriptures. <laughs> um, we're all speaking in English accents today, in celebration of Independence Day. <laughs> you can imagine how Jamal spent his uh, Independence Day, you know, doesn't celebrate. It's still under the bondage of the monarchy. All right. Um, I, I always have the best <laughs> Jamal's chops. Uh, anyways. So, um, just a blessing for you guys, uh, the ironic blessing, and it's just ironic that my name is Aaron, uh, but this is the ironic blessing for you guys. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Jesus. Um, so we're so glad to have our new King family here. And our literal family here. Hey, mom and dad, good to see you guys. They came for this. Um, and any guests that are here and any spiritual seekers, um, we, if you are seeking uh, religion right now and you're trying to determine what the truth is, you are welcome here. This is a place where uh, we, we kind of made this place with you in mind, so we're happy to have you here searching. Um, and we hope to show you an authentic following of Jesus Christ. So uh, if you're just joining us in the middle of this series, we're doing a series on David. Um, and we're looking at David's heart specifically because he had this testimony from God's word. It is said that he was a man after God's own heart. And that's quite a testimony to have. Uh, and we've, be, we've been considering just what that looks like, all the different facets of David's life uh, because if we can take hold of David's heart, then we can gain a key into the heart of Christ, uh, which is our aim to be like. Our aim is to be like Christ. So, um, so uh, we just read Psalm 22, which is the Psalm of the Cross. That's what it's known as. It's the first, the, those words, uh, the first words there were the words that Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, just the sense of despair and abandonment that Christ seems to have experienced on the cross that David also was experiencing when he wrote this psalm. It's very strange when you think about it, actually. Um, and we're not actually going to be doing a study of Psalm 22. Uh, we're, that's more providing us a backdrop of David's heart for suffering. So we're uh, more looking at the suffering that he experienced and how we can see David's heart for suffering, the heart of God that's in him for suffering. Um, suffering, it's one of those concepts that's so evident and so foregrounded in the scriptures uh, as a normal experience for Christians, and yet we have no idea how to deal with it. Uh, we are shocked when calamity happens to us or when people despise us for siding with Christ over our culture or their preferences. That's really amazing, not only because suffering is the common experience of God's people in this fallen and antagonistic world, but because God shows us time and time again that suffering is the path that he uses to get to glory. By the end of our time together, I want us to consider what would happen if we were a people who joyfully chose the path less traveled, the path of suffering. David, the man after God's own heart, he had that heart for suffering that Christ had, and we'll see, Lord willing, how David's heart shows us that. But what you come to realize from David's heart is that not only is suffering unavoidable on the path to taking the kingdom, it is the path, and so we must take that path. So I'm going to pray for us that the Lord would speak to us through his word. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace that you have given us your presence. You have given us so many perfect gifts. You've given us your son, Jesus. You've given us the riches of your spirit. 
we have you with us right now, the hope of glory, Christ in us. Um, thank you for eternal life that we have. And not just life, but life abundant, life better than we could ever have on our own. So thank you, God, for how you gave your son and you made him walk the path of suffering so that he could be glorified and so that we could be glorified. I pray that you would just open our eyes and open our ears to your word, that you would speak to us the truths of your word, the truths of your spirit, the truth about suffering, your plan for suffering in our lives. Um, so just speak to us, teach us what we need to hear, remove any distractions or anything that is not from you, um, and just let us hear clearly from you. We want to open our hearts to you, Lord, right now. Um, so open our hearts for us. We love you, Lord, and we pray this all in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so <clears throat> what you look at in, when you look at 1 Samuel and the second half of 1 Samuel, you realize that just like Jesus, David had to suffer before he could become king. Like Christ, it was through suffering that he would gain the kingdom, and there really was no other way. Uh, we've had a pretty clear picture so far in our series of David's suffering up until now. Uh, where we left off was that he had, all, he had just gotten the kingship, and he was living into that. Um, so we've had a pretty good picture of that, of his suffering, and the different ways we've looked at that. Um, but I just want to refresh your memory, uh, especially if you weren't with us, of the different afflictions that David faced on his road to taking the kingdom. Um, so we see that the spirit of the enemy was immediately against God's anointed, intent on afflicting him. And we see this in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, where we read of David's anointing. It says this, Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. But then in the next verse, we get this testimony of David's mortal enemy. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, who was the source of all of his affliction in the first, before he became king. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. King Saul sovereignly driven by this tormenting spirit of darkness, antagonized and afflicted David until the day of his death. And we see that the very day after David had entered Saul's service, Saul, what does he do? This is after he had just killed Goliath of Gath. He had just made himself, uh, the, he was the apple of Saul's eye for one day. And right after that, this is, he tries to kill him. 1 Samuel 18.9 says this, Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, for, but he had departed from Saul. So even then, no matter what Saul did to him, though, you see that David, his response wasn't rebellion or revolution. He was faithful. Saul promises David his daughter, Merab, but then he gives her to another. So we see that his, his injustice that he commits to David continues. He promises his other daughter, Michael, trying to use her as a trap against David, offering her in exchange for 100 Philistine foreskins. So <laughs> that's a pretty interesting uh, thing right there. So King Saul, <laughs> he, he said, you know, kill 100 Philistines and mutilate them. Uh, and then I will give you my daughter, Michael. Uh, and he did this, hoping that he would die in the process. Why should my hand be against David? I'll let my enemy kill David. Uh, but David went above and beyond, and 200 Philistine foreskins later, uh, he had Michael as a wife. So um, that's a lot of foreskins, right? Well, anyways, so 
And then in chapter 18, verse 28, it says this, but when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. In chapter 19, Saul conspired with all of his servants to have David killed, but Jonathan, his son, talked him out of it. And then David deals a mighty blow to the Philistines, and again Saul tries to kill him in chapter 19, verse 9. It says, Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. Now, have you noticed that? This is, this is the third time that we've seen that expression, where a harmful spirit, a tormenting spirit, was sent by God onto Saul. So I think that maybe, geez, the, the scripture might be trying to tell us something that we want to catch there. Um, but uh, it continues, then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the lyre, and Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he eluded Saul. Then Saul sent his servants to kill David, but Michael, David's wife, helped him escape. He sends his servants to kill David again in Ramah, where David was hiding with Samuel, the prophet. But everyone he sent, that, that Saul sent after him, uh, ended up having the Spirit of God fall on them so that they prophesied. So then Saul says, well, I guess you got to do something right. You got to do it yourself. So he goes, but then he starts prophesying, and he strips off all his clothes and gets naked and starts prophesying. It's embarrassing. Um, and so David was then separated from his dear friend Jonathan in the midst of all this, uh, all this conspiring to kill him, uh, his dear friend Jonathan, who was Saul's son, because Saul, um, and, and so Jonathan, he warns him of Saul's plots to kill him. Uh, gee, I didn't know. Uh, it's pretty obvious. I told you that originally, Jonathan, and, uh, and the scriptures say that they wept together, and David weeping the most. David left, and he got some help from the priest of Nob, but Saul's servant, Doeg the Edomite, reported the fact. And so Saul, when he went to Nob, he ordered Doeg to slaughter all of the priests of Nob. And only one escaped, and he joined David. So da David was relentlessly pursued by Saul. I mean, we're just, we're just getting into it. Like, it, he, more, more suffering was to follow. Because then David went and he hid in the wilderness of Ziph. Doesn't that sound like something out of a fantasy, the wilderness of Ziph? The Ziphites, who were there in the wilderness of Ziph, apparently, they told it to Saul that David was there. And Saul almost captured him. But God delivered him, and David escaped to another wilderness, the wilderness of En Gedi. Saul pursued him again, uh, and unknowingly, he came into the very cave that David was hiding. And while he was sleeping, David could have killed his enemy. Uh, but only instead he cut off a piece of Saul's robe. Um, but even that, he felt convicted. So even in this, we see David's faithfulness. Even when injustice was being done to him, he was still being faithful um, to God's anointed one. Um, he felt convicted, thinking he'd done something wrong against God's anointed just by cutting off a piece of his garment. And he convinced his men to not attack Saul. And when Saul found out, he let him go only to pursue him again, though. Uh, later, David went to the wilderness of Ziph, where the Ziphites again ratted him out, and Saul pursued him, and David spared Saul again. Again, he spares him. So David decided to run to the Philistines to escape Saul, where he spends the rest of Saul's life until he dies in battle. So this is almost half of 1 Samuel that I basically just summarized, the second half of 1 Samuel, uh, and it's devoted to basically to David's suffering his path of suffering to kingship, um, his unjust suffering under the affliction of King Saul, who was motivated by an evil spirit, the spirit of an enemy, the spirit of darkness that was sent on Saul by God. So we, we might ask ourselves, why? You know, why did he have to suffer? Why did God put David through these, it seems like he put him through these, um, what's that expression, the rings? You know, he put him through these hula hoops. What is that? Put him through the rings. The ringers? Is that what it is? Okay, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Anyway, uh, made him jump hoops, jump through hoops. That's the one I was thinking of. I kind of mixed up a couple of them. Anyway, seems like he's making him jump through hoops, you know? Um, <laughs> so why did he have to suffer? We, we could ask this question on so many levels. Uh, why would the sovereign God allow his beloved one to suffer so much? The one he said he loved. 
Couldn't there have been a, an easier way to gaining the kingdom? Was there some kind of benefit from David's suffering? To what end did he really suffer? And we could probably spend all of our time just answering this question, not only in regards to David, but to Christ, and not only to Christ, but to all the history of martyrs and to the world at large of Christians being persecuted, and even to the history of humanity going through suffering, the world being subjected, not willingly, to suffering. Um, But I want to point out some simple things that the scripture shows us. Uh, First off, let's look at the direct cause of David's suffering. Uh, We know that his suffering certainly happened under the watching, the sovereign eye of God, and it was the plan of God who loved him, but what were these direct causes, right? So the first is related to a spiritual reality. Um, The work of a spiritual enemy was dead set against God's anointed one, and we already saw this a little bit. It's, It's this and we see it especially in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13 to 14, this, this important comparison that the author, inspired by God, wants us to see. Um, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. I mean, it's juxtaposed. Um, by this juxtaposition of these two verses, right, we see God through the human author is giving us clear insight into the spiritual antagonism by human agency that's happening here. He's using a person, filling him with evil, to make him the antagonist of his anointed one. Whoa. Um... We see this two other times, right? We already saw them. Then evil spirit rushes on Saul, sent from the Lord in chapter 18, verse 10, and comes on him again in chapter 19, verse 9. Now, this is important to note because we realize that our our enemy, it's not just an individual human. Uh, Who is our enemy? Well, the Apostle Paul, he gives us some insight into this in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, In verse 10, he says this, Finally, Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. So God is letting us on into an invisible reality, a a spiritual war that has been waged nearly since the beginning. Our great enemy as God's church is not people who might persecute us, it is the kingdom of darkness. It is one kingdom at war with another. And the authorities in this kingdom will not let go of their dominion so easily. Through the work of Lucifer, they have captured the hearts and minds of humanity and enslaved their wills toward evil. And the Apostle Paul, he writes of this, this enslavement, the spiritual enslavement of humanity in Ephesians 2, where he reminds the Ephesians of their former state without Christ. Here's who they were before they had Christ, without Christ. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So on the road to claiming what is his by divine decree, God's anointed one, his chosen one, is opposed by the ones that God has rejected. 
the spiritual authorities that God is deposing. And not only do they use God's creation, humans, to afflict the rightful king, they use the leaders and the crowds of God's own people, Israel. So this is true of David, this is true of Christ, and this is, you see this in David's prophetic words in Psalm 22 when he is crying out to God for his suffering of being afflicted. He says this in verses 6 through 8, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. These are the mocking words that they had for Jesus on the cross, right? He said, he said those words. It's like they, they just played right into the narrative of this prophecy. He said the words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first words of this psalm, and then they fulfilled what happens next. Now, he says, he said, this is interesting, uh, he says it in uh, Syrian, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And Eloi um, was similar to the word Elias or Elijah. And so when they heard it, they, they didn't just mishear him. I, I, some people think that maybe they misheard him, but I think that they were mocking him, and a lot of other people think this. I didn't just come up with this. Um, they, so he, they said, oh, he's crying out for Elijah to save him. Let Elijah save him if he really is God's anointed one. And they mock him just like the prophecy foretold. Um, and then they, they it, it, it describes his death here, right? If, in case you don't see the parallels, let me just draw them out for you really quickly. Uh, in Psalm 22, uh, in verse 16, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, Jesus is saying this on the cross, referencing this passage. He could have said all these words from the cross. He could have just clearly spoken this whole psalm and you could have seen the spirit, the reality being played out before him, word for word. His hands were pierced, and his feet were pierced with the nails, and his his garments were being. The Roman soldiers were gambling to see who would take them. I mean, it, it, this is like to me. This is just one of the things that clearly shows the authenticity of Christ as the Messiah, the promised one, the one who was prophesied of, because it just sh- it, it's so clear. Like you cannot deny, you can't, you can't, you can't trick Roman soldiers into doing these things. You can't trick someone into crucifying you. You can't trick someone into um, performing an instrument of torture that hadn't even been invented in the time of David. So, just so realize that. I mean, when, next time you read Psalm 22, read it in the voice of Jesus. Imagine him on the cross before his enemies being mocked and scoffed and see that he really could have said this entire psalm in its entirety. And in fact, um, I'm going off on a big rabbit trail here, but um, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not a rabbit trail. It's pretty relevant, right? But... Um, but we see that Jesus kind of, his last words, he kind of, he kind of shows the fulfillment of this passage. He says something a little bit differently than we see in this passage. Uh, in the last two verses, posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. That he has done it. It had not been done in the time of David, but at that moment, when Christ was separated from the Father, experienced hell, he said, it is finished. It is done. I have done it. And now we declare he has done it. And we, we fulfill, we are fulfillment of this passage. We are going to the ends of the earth, declaring that he has done it. That was for free. That was for free. Um, <laughs> don't have to pay for that one. Don't have to put that in the offering. I could keep going. Um, all right. So besides the antagonism of the enemy, 
Um, another reason that David suffered was a, di- a direct result of his submission to God. Uh, David feared God. He feared him more than he feared what the enemy could do to him. At two different times, we see that David could have killed Saul. We already talked about them. Both of these times were in the wilderness. But David didn't see it as an opportunity. That's, that's kind of interesting to me. David didn't see, I mean, he put him to, God put Saul to sleep, and yet David did not see this as an open door opportunity. I would have thought, God just opened a door for me, a door of opportunity. I've got to walk through it. I've got to kill him. <laughs> I have to. Um, but he wouldn't do it. Why wouldn't he take this opportunity to kill his enemy? Hadn't God provided him this opportunity to avenge himself? You know? And, and that's what David's men saw. That's what they said to him. They said, God has provided you an opportunity. This is your moment. And he could barely restrain them, but we see why he wouldn't do it in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 6. He says this, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. Then when he again spared him in chapter 26, verse 10, he says this to his his other commander, his his Abijah, I think was his name, son of Zeruiah, brother of Joab. He was with him and he's like, let me strike him down. And everybody was asleep. God had clearly put everyone to sleep. And this is what David responds to Abijah. He says, do not destroy him. For who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down in battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. David honored God. He feared God. He did not despise the word of God. God had anointed Saul for a task, and he would not put it into his own hands to fulfill God's word to him. He feared him. He trusted him. And his fear and trust of God extended itself to a fear and respect of Saul in that he would not kill him. So that's why David wouldn't raise a finger against him. He trusted that God would establish his throne. Eventually, Saul would perish, and he would take his place, but he would not sin against God by doing this himself. And so, the natural consequence of his obedience and of his fear and of his submission to God and his trust in God was that he would have to continue to endure the afflictions of Saul until the time appointed by God. And David would not be the same man if he, he would not be David. He would not be the man after God's own heart if he had taken this into his own hands. We would not be saying David was a man after God's own heart. He would just be one of the, of the kings that you've, most of us have never heard about in First and Second Kings, the evil kings. And so the road to take the kingdom was a long one, but this also reflects the heart of Jesus. Jesus himself would do nothing outside of the will of God, nothing apart from it, even if it entailed his suffering. And that is where we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right before the suffering of our Lord was about to start, he was thick in prayer. He said this to his father in Luke 22. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so great was his agony in this moment, as he's praying this, that as he prayed, even more earnestly, the scripture then says that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. How great was the suffering of this man of sorrows, that he should have such anxiety merely in the contemplation of the suffering that he was about to endure. But even so, despite the suffering that he knew that he was subjecting himself to, he preferred the Father's will to his own. 
he would not despise the plans of his father, whatever, wherever they would take him. Though the path of suffering was long on the road to Calvary, he would take it. You see the heart of this path of suffering to glory, the very heart, the crux of this heart, of this path of suffering. It's a firm denial of self, a denial of self. That's what we're seeing here in in this. Um, And we don't know exactly when David wrote Psalm 22, uh, but it's obvious that he wrote this in a time of his greatest suffering when he felt like God had abandoned him. He said, he said those words. You know, Spurgeon, he said this, that when you're looking at Psalm 22, you lose entirely David, and you just get caught up in Jesus the Messiah. And he says that's a good thing, you know, obviously. Um, But you do forget that David also said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, And he felt like God had abandoned him sometime in this time um, in his life. In those first words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You can see the sense of despair with which David cried to his God. The very same sense of abandonment and despair, yet in a much, much deeper sense that Jesus experienced on the cross. And is that really what God wants for us, for his beloved, for his people, for his anointed one, for his righteous one, for the one that he loves, to suffer, even to the point of despair? So apparently it was right in the Father's eyes that the path of Christ's glory and the path of David's glory should be a path of suffering. Listen to what, if you've, Psalm 22, if you, if you think Psalm 22 is cool, look at Isaiah 53. That's another really good prophecy about the suffering of Christ that just shows, I, you know, like, I'm not even like, I think Jesus is the Messiah. Like, I mean, look at the scriptures and read and weep it and love it. And uh, Isaiah 53, I mean, clearest prophecy there is. Um, I, we're not going to look at the whole thing, but but look at what it says about this road of suffering that the heart of God, the Father for His Son in this. In chapter 53, verse 10, verse 10, he says, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And I, I don't really love how the, that's the ESV, I don't love how the ESV puts it. Um, most translations prefer its more literal sense, which is rendered thus, yet it pleased the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Now, we know that God isn't a sadist, right? We know that. We know that God is good and loving. So, you know, let's just put that, that's not even an option on the table Uh, But it is unavoidable, if we're honest with ourselves, to see in Scripture that God is pleased to use the road of suffering in His sovereign plan to further His plans. And He does this with the end in mind of glory. Suffering in this world, it isn't the ultimate thing to avoid in the eyes of God Contrary to that, it is actually the very path to taking the kingdom that God is offering to taking glory, to participating in glory. So I hope that in your mind you've been asking throughout this sermon, uh, what about us, right? Is God also calling us to suffer? What does this mean for me that David's suffering, Christ's suffering? Um... And I am bound by God's word to bear you witness that, yes, we must also travel the same path. Whether we go kicking and screaming, or we go unconsciously, or we go joyously, that is up to us. So you see that this is a basic calling of following Christ from his earliest teachings. Uh, When he was first calling people to follow him, 
it is repeated in the Gospels three times in these words of Jesus. Uh, the ones I'm going to quote you are Luke 9, 23, but they're also found um, mostly the same, just maybe a word or two different in Matthew 16, 24 and Mark 8, 34. But it says this, Jesus said this, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's so interesting that Jesus said these words before he ever took up the cross. He hadn't taken up the cross at this point. Nobody even suspected that he was taking up the cross. In retrospect, it makes sense that he was signifying to his disciples what death he would die, but how strange to, to, to demand that people should take up an instrument of torture, for many a symbol of oppression and others a symbol of fierce justice, and thus follow him. This is what a follower of Jesus is called to, though, to firm self-denial, to submission to the will of God. And Jesus listed for people the things that they would have to leave in their pursuit of him. Listen to how Jesus talks about this, and you can turn to it in Luke 14. I'm going to start in verse 25. And he, he shows us, if you have an ESV, you'll see that the header over verse 25 is the cost of discipleship, and I think that gets at perfectly of what Jesus is trying to convey to us. Uh, but starting in so starting in verse 25. <clears throat> now great crowds accompanied him. And he turned. So first of all, just watch how there's a, lot, there's a crowd following him. It's not just his, his immediate followers. There's a crowd following him. So watch how he's going to thin them out. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Jesus loves doing that. He always thins out the crowds. So maybe we'll thin out the crowds today. I don't know. <laughs> um, there's too many people here. You're gonna, no, I'm kidding. Um, anyway. So, um, <laughs> so, verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What the heck? I know. What? Like, it sounds like Jesus is saying, hate? What? So let's just keep reading. Let's, let's, let's worry about that later. Let's just keep reading. Um, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation <clears throat> and is not able to finish... All who see it begin to mock him. I don't know. Sorry. Oh, gosh. Mm, okay. I can't read. Okay. <clears throat> Saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in, in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Uh, you'd be crying too if you thought about just what the implications of this are on our lives, right? Okay, okay, all right. Keep it together. All right. The implications are that we may have to sacrifice a lot in this life. We might have to sacrifice a lot. Okay, okay, all right. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so... We may have to suffer a lot, and I'm crying because I know we have missionaries here who are going. <sighs> yeah, yeah, okay, all right, okay, all right. Woo, all right. We're going to a place that's difficult. To... 
<laughs> and we're going to a place that's difficult. And, um, man, my voice is choking. Oh, all right. We're going to a place that's, you're going to a place that's difficult. <sighs> I was thinking about you guys when I was writing this whole sermon. Just now. What you guys may have to endure. And, um, yeah, anyways, and, um, and if you know anybody who's suffered in their witness of Christ, yeah, it's, all right, okay, I'm just going to have to keep going. All right, <clears throat> pull this up to my face, I can't read it. All right, was Jesus calling them to suffer the loss of all things when he said this? Is Jesus calling us right now to suffer the loss of all things? I believe he is. It's the same gospel that Paul preached throughout Asia Minor after Christ's ascension. When he and Barnabas were, as in Acts 14.22, it says this, they were strengthening the the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And I like how the Berean Bible study, uh, Berean Bible, uh, Berean study Bible says it. It says, we must endure many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. The apostle Paul, he also wrote this in Philippians 1. He said, for it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Paul then laid letter, uh, later, in the same letter, Philippians, he gave a testimony to what he had suffered in the pursuit of Christ. He had already suffered from the beginning, from the get-go, in his pursuit of Christ. And you can read that whole testimony in Philippians 3 of all the things that he suffered the loss of in the pursuit of knowing Christ. But I'm just going to read, I'm going to break in to that testimony in verse 8. And it's one of the most insightful pieces of Scripture. It says this, In verse 8, chapter 3 of Philippians. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And again, I much prefer how other versions put it. They, they don't put it, may share in his sufferings. They put it this way, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. The fellowship of his sufferings. That's what I want to know, is the fellowship of his sufferings. You can't know Christ completely without knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. It it was Paul's aim to not just know Christ in his resurrection or in his power or in his glory or in his victory. Paul knew that you cannot have those things without traveling that same path that Jesus traveled, the path of suffering. This is the fellowship of his suffering. And it reminds me of, um, this might sound so dumb. Have, has anybody ever heard of Stewart's? No one. What? Stewart's ice cream? Oh, yeah. yeah. So Stewart's ice cream. I lived in the Adirondacks for a while, and um, Stewart's ice cream is some of the best ice cream you can get. So one of my favorite all-time flavor was Happy Camper. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, it was graham crackers and, like, chocolate bits and marshmallow pieces. It was to die for. To die for. And Stewart's was about 20 minutes north. And so if I wanted to get that Happy Camper ice cream, I had to travel the road to get to Stewart's, right? It's a silly illustration. But the point is that... If you want to get to glory, if you want to get to this power, if you want to know Christ, you have to travel that road. You don't just have the ice cream, you know, 
helicopter flown in, right? You, do, you cannot circumvent the path of suffering in getting to glory. Um, you can't. You can't circumvent it. And Christ did not leave us his example of suffering so that we could live our best lives now, right? Christ did not leave us an example of suffering to win us financial security or, or the best fitting, most fulfilling and rewarding job. That's not Christ's ultimate aim for us. He didn't suffer th- so that you could live in the city or the state or the country that you liked the most. His blood was not given so that our nation could experience political success and economic growth. And he didn't die so that humans could establish their own utopia devoted to human flourishing, right? These are not the ultimate aims of God in exposing his most beloved son to agony, in delivering his son to death. What was the end of the path of suffering? What did the Father have in mind? So, the Father had in mind our salvation, absolutely. But perhaps in a bigger way, he had in mind glory, uh, ultimately to glorify himself and his Son and to have us to share in his glory. So, Before Jesus went to eat with his disciples in the Last Supper, he spoke to the crowd of his final hour. He said this in John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Then after they had left the upper room, after they had eaten the Last Supper, he gave what has become known as his high priestly prayer in John 17. He prayed this, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So yes, Jesus' path of suffering was to end in his glory and end the glory of his Father, but also a glory that he prayed that we would share in. And here are the last words of his high priestly prayer in John 17. He prayed this, I do not ask for these only, speaking of his his 11 disciples who were there, um, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them. Isn't that crazy? The glory that you have given me, I have given them. That they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. What an incredible prayer. What an incredible insight we get there, into the plan of God for Christ's suffering, for our suffering, for the history of human suffering, even, I think. Um, His purpose is to make us one with him, to give us his presence, to let us witness his glory and participate in his glory. God is making us one with him, and sharing his glory with us. What? What road would he not take to get us there? So 
in all this, if you're still not convinced that maybe uh, we as New Testament, you know, believers uh, are called to follow Christ's path of suffering, if we as New Testament disciples, uh, here's what the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 20, verse 21. Uh, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. His steps on that path to suffering. That's why he left the example for us. And in case you are still not convinced, Peter also said in 1 Peter 4, verse 1, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourselves. Equip yourselves for war, for combat, with the same attitude that Christ had in him. The same mindset. Um, it's obvious that we are called to the same path that David took, the same path that Christ took to lay claim to their kingdoms. We are not laying hold of our own kingdom, but of Christ's kingdom. We are not laying hold of our own glory, but of Christ's glory, and yet also Christ will glorify us as his Father glorified him. Looking at these passages, it's, uh, it's easy for us to think that this is closer to home for the pastor who is in prison for his faith, or for the Christian book publisher who is never seen again, or for the missionary who found a death threat in her home. These are all true stories that I've I know of that either one of them was from just the media, one is a friend that I have in China, one is um, their friend who was never seen again. And I, 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 I um, yeah, it's, and I don't want to mention your name over this because uh, online, you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, and, and as if we might think that maybe our friends here can relate to more than we could ever relate, and there is some truth to that, but um, there, there is also truth that we can experience this. It, it might be easy to distance us from the scriptures when we're reading it in the morning, eating, drinking our coffee, you know, sitting on our comfy couch, um, but this can be applied here to this path of suffering. Um, it, it's not that we, and I think that we want this, I think that some of us do actually want this, that it's not just that we don't want this. Um, it's not all that distant. It's not simply suffering by persecution that the apostles are writing about when you look at these passages. Um, in fact, when you read the full context of a lot of these passages, uh, two modes of suffering become prevalent. So one is blamelessly suffering under people unjustly when you do right and suffer for it. And the second is suffering as you fight against the inclinations of the flesh. You see that a lot in these passages. I encourage you to look at them in further detail. Uh, we don't have time, but you can see this specifically in that passage we mentioned, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, for doing what the world wants to do living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So listen, if, if you live a life of holiness, you can bet that you'll experience these modes of suffering. People don't like it when you don't entirely embrace 
or live into their lifestyle of sin or wholeheartedly approve of it. So in holy living, you will experience suffering by rejection in this world. As they scoff you like they scoffed our Lord, they, and you will experience suffering as you, not only in people rejecting you as you live a life of holiness, but also as you put to death what is earthly within you. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to Timothy, and right before he describes something akin to when Jesus said that in these last days, men's heart will grow cold. He describes how people will love themselves and money, be proud and arrogant, heartless, not loving good, treacherous, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That is the state of humanity right now. He was speaking prophetically of a progressive decline of humanity. Um, then he says this after that in 2 Timothy 3, verses 12 through 13. He says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He promises that. Will be persecuted. While evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. The unholy world will always despise holiness, but we have this promise that the path of suffering will end in glory. And look at this. This is one of the, those clear passages that shows where this path of suffering takes us to glory. In Romans chapter 8, and starting in verse 16, it says this. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Right now, the history of humanity is that history of labor pains. That's the, the picture he gives us, labor pains. A mother does not enjoy the temporal pains of labor, but she values the product as precious and dear. She would not trade it for anything. Yes, God, he could have made a world without the pains of labor. In fact, before the curse, there was no pain in giving birth, is what we read in Genesis. But did he choose that all things should labor to bring many sons to glory? And we have the privilege of joining his son in the fellowship of his sufferings. Through this path, we will see glory and we will see his kingdom. So in conclusion, some of you are thinking, finally. Um, not only is suffering unavoidable on the path to suffering, it is the path, uh, or sorry, not only is the, pa is the path of suffering unavoidable on the way to the kingdom and to glory, it is the path, and we must take it. So let us take a moment to consider, let us dream a bit. What if we were like that? What if we were a people armed with the mindset of Christ, a people wholly committed to following his will, even if it meant suffering in the flesh, even if it meant suffering at the hands of evil men and of the enemies of God. I think that if we were a people armed with a mindset that wasn't sufferings averse, but loved so hard that we didn't shy from this path of suffering, I think that's when we would see a spiritual revolution happen in our time. 
And so I just want to leave you with this last word from the Apostle James in chapter 5 of his letter, verse 7. It says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So let us take hold of this in our time. Let us take hold of this in our time. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, ah, Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your, your guidance and your spirit. Thank you so much for walking the path of suffering to bring many sons to glory, to bring many of us to glory. I pray that you would just put boldness in us. Give us boldness so that we can live lives of holiness, put to death the flesh, to be a people who speak your word and your truth, who live holy despite what people think or what, who, what people might do to us. I pray that you would just guide us in the same heart that David had, this heart that your son Jesus had. Do this by your spirit. Teach us. Pray all these things in the name of your blessed son, Jesus Christ. Amen.